Well, great. It's wonderful, you know, to have you all. Um, I know it's just Aaron and I and Mary as well. We just want to do a, a quick kind of thank you and, and great to partner and be together for this session in the last two days. I'm really looking forward to your session in particular to help frame and, and further dive into the mentoring world, the informal, the formal. Um, and so that, that was really what I wanted to share. We're going to turn it over, but I also wanted to have Aaron, um, any, any words, any quick notes? I, I just wanted again, <laughs> just to express our sincere thanks to the entire team at Mentor, um, because it, it, this is an incredible partnership. I look forward to continuing to grow and to deepen our relationship as, as organizations and huge shout out to Matt, because he's been awesome during this entire process. So with that, I'll turn it over to your way, Matt. That sounds great. I'm really excited for, for this moment. Um, I think in a very similar way to yesterday, um, I am excited to get out of the way and hear from some amazing leaders. Um, yesterday were leaders that are household names and the idea of some of the athletes that are our role models because of the amazing ways they perform on court or on field. And um, they were able to join us because not only do they excel in, in their in their main day job but they also excel uh, in terms of social justice and activism today I, I am joined by two amazing amazing leaders who you may not yet know um, but by the end of this next hour you will um, and mentor as an organization exists to fuel the mentoring field and to really create a movement and we talk a lot as an organization about the idea that if you're to walk down the street and you're to ask young and you're to ask a random person on the street what do young people need in order to succeed and thrive people are going to talk about the important things education even more important in terms of food and water and health people probably aren't going to talk about caring adult relationships unprompted and the idea of how do we make sure that no young person has to walk the path to adulthood alone. And especially for young people who are confronted by poverty. The idea that the caring adults in their life most likely have less time to devote to their development needs because they may be working two jobs. There's no difference in, in amount of love or anything else, but the idea of young people facing the additional barrier and every additional barrier just makes it harder. And the idea of the inequity that exists in our society being so prevalent and mentoring as a field, as a concept is one of the ways that we are able to try to equalize the playing field as best as we can in this unfair, unjust world and wanting to be very intentional as we're talking about this that we are not saying mentoring is solving every other issue but it needs to also be a part of the solution and it's something that we talk about a lot um, my favorite quote and i mentioned this yesterday um, about the mentoring field comes from president obama at the state of the union address so from the united states standpoint the biggest possible forum uh, in our country. And he said, each of us is here because somebody somewhere stood up for us. And that concept to me is in the back of my mind of everything that we are trying to accomplish today. How do we make sure that those somebodies are more and more frequent in the lives of our young people and they're doing more and more good and less harm in the lives of our young people? Um, today, we get to hear from two experts uh, that really have kind of almost a TED talk to, to deliver to each of you on two really important concepts. The first will be Dudney Silla, and he is going to be talking about having a mentoring mindset in wherever you're interacting with young people. And then we get to hear from Dr. Tori Weston Sardan, and she is somebody that doesn't work for a mentor but in terms of the impact she has had in an organization she might as well um we had required reading for all of our staff to read her 
book entitled Critical Mentoring, and she's going to be talking about that concept. And it is just so powerful every time I've had the opportunity to hear her speak and to learn from her wisdom. So that is really it from an opening for me. And I am going to be moderating, um, moderating the chat and just, just keeping us moving throughout. But um, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, we'll get a chance to hear from Dudney. And then 10 or 15 minutes, getting a chance to hear from, from Tori. And then really wanting to engage in a deep dialogue with everybody about these two crucial concepts that we're going to get a chance to talk about. So without anything further, I'm honored to be able to even be on the same screen as these two. And uh, Dudney, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it right to you. Oh, thank you so, so much, Matt, for, for having me. And I'm very relieved I get to go before Tori, because it would have been a wrap for me if I had to go after. So uh, thank you for doing that great favor. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, it's an honor um, to be here on behalf of Mentor and to learn from all the amazing guests from yesterday and earlier this, this morning and, and, and folks to come you know, after this session as well. Um, like Matt said, my name is Dudney Silla, I'm born in Haiti, grew up in Boston. Um, shout out to you know, my Haitian family, um, who, who is a huge reason why I'm here today. Um, and I serve as a program director here at Mentor, where I get to collaborate with our staff and our amazing affiliate network throughout the country um, to develop and, and to train and to provide assistance around mentoring and this concept of the mentoring mindset, which is really about the idea that adults in the lives of young people, and as you've heard earlier, adults as peers with one another, have the ability to show up for each other in ways that are intentional, developmental, culturally responsive, safe, and supportive. Um, being mentor-like or adopting a mentoring mindset is really an approach to relationships that recognizes how essential belonging and purpose is to all of us as human beings and for the development of youth. Um, and how coming together through relationship is so essential as we seek to strengthen ourselves and our communities. And many young people find incredible mentoring opportunity across the wide variety of mentoring programs, big and small, throughout the U.S., who do incredible work related to group mentoring and peer mentoring or one-to-one -one mentoring to make sure that young people have access to that positive support. Alongside that, there are over 40 million young people who are connected to informal mentors, mentors who are in their everyday life, you know, who show up as role models, as sources of spark and inspiration and guiding lights for young people through their everyday lives. You know, and many of us have had individuals like this in our lives and, and still do to this day. Um, you know, this could be the barber or hairdresser who connected with you and encouraged you to stay committed to school, like my barber did whenever my father would take me out for haircuts, uh, which my dad loved, uh, to have additional support with keeping education top and center for me and my siblings. Um, like you've heard today, this could be for coaches in your life who support you, a teacher at the school, a crossing guard, a bus driver um, who makes the time to say hello to you every day and give you a word of encouragement when you are struggling, you know, like mine did when I was young and navigating teasing and different struggles. Um, for young people, this could be the supervisor that you meet during your first summer internship experience, you know, an activist you get to learn from at a local community meeting, um, an uncle or an aunt, an extended family member or a neighbor who you can call day or night no matter what happens or the amazing staff member that you, know, you and your peers as kids rallied around in an after-school program or a counselor at a summer camp, right, your local YMCA. Um, and adopting the mentoring mindset is also done by the incredible parents and guardians as well, who every day, in addition to ensuring the health and safety of their kids, support their identity and support their passions, even when those around them perhaps didn't show up for them. Um, and sports is such an incredible arena for the power of relationships. You know, sports in and of itself, the impact of movement on the brain and health and self-regulation is so important. But you also get to learn to lean on your teammates and apply lessons from your coach and build skills through that commitment. 
um, to fundamentals and consistency and relationship. Um, no one um, succeeds alone. And, you know, so today, you know, really, I, I have one story, um, four principles and five action steps that I wanted to share uh, real quickly before I toss it over to Tori. <clears throat> you know, when I think about one of the most impactful uh, moments in my life, um, you know, as a shy kid who struggled with confidence and body image, there was a teacher in my high school who uh, connected with me and believed in me. We actually went to the same school or alum of the same uh, middle school and elementary school. And she worked with me on, a, on an organization in high school that really helped to grow me, where we got to study things like race and equity and social justice. And I grew in my confidence. And she really treated me like I was her right-hand person, like we were equals. We both got to teach and learn from one another. And I essentially served as an intern for three years in high school, helping to build this club that brought kids from multiple schools together to have discussions about their world and how to change it. And it had a profound impact on me. And I remember um, she nominated me. I wasn't sure um, during the college process whether or not college would be for me because of just the economics of it, how expensive it was. And she nominated me for this amazing opportunity with the Posse Foundation for a scholarship. And there was an interview with over 350 incredible young people. And I remember showing up um, at the front door and doing the math in my head, knowing there were probably a few spots and all these amazing young people. I started to turn around and go home. I started to walk back towards a train and skip out on an opportunity to at least interview for this opportunity not thinking that I would have a chance. And what allowed me to pause and turn around was I started as I was walking away to think about my parents, think about my family and the Haitian enclave who cultivated me and supported me, who had that mentor mindset, who were safe spaces and were present and connected with me um, through their love and their passion. But I also thought about that teacher, the fact that she nominated me, the fact that she believed in me, the fact that she um, was always there for me and supporting me throughout my journey, throughout as I got to learn about my identity. And I ended up walking into the interview and eventually did get the scholarship, which helped to change my life, to be able to go receive that education and end up in front of you all today. And when I think about that moment, I was, I'm so fascinated by it because even though this was an opportunity for a free merit-based scholarship, it wasn't that that inspired me to walk in. It was the relationship. It was a relationship to my community and it was a relationship to her and seeing myself through them and them seeing themselves through me that encouraged me to take an opportunity in the world and to have the courage to show up. And that's really at the heart of what the mentoring mindset is. You know, it's, it's four core principles I like to talk about. It's, you know, being intentional, it's being supportive, it's being developmental and communal. So letting a young person know, I see you, I notice you. Like so many young people go through a day or go through a week without someone saying hi, checking in on them. It's really important that we make the time to see young people and to take the time to notice them, to know what their goals are, to know the context of where they come from, uh, to know yourself as well and what biases and traumas you bring to the table and to have a strength-based orientation as you collaborate with them and work with them. It's also important to be supportive as well, to let a young person know, I got you. <laughs> I'm gonna be here consistently. I'm gonna be fully present in our interactions. I'm going to, for the coaches, I'm going to coaching questions. So not only leaning on instruction and commands, but communicating in questions. What did you see there? What did you think about that? validating and connecting to their lens and how they see the world, leading with that curiosity, and being a safe place where there's healthy boundaries and appropriate disclosure. Thirdly, about being developmental, letting a young person know, hey, I'm here to help. You know, the Search Institute has an incredible framework, the developmental relationships framework, which talks about um, how adults can do things like share power and challenge growth and expand possibilities for young people. And you can be there to help develop a plan of action with them and to respect and learn from their culture and their background 
and as you'll hear from, from, from Tori, Dr. Lisa Sardin, about critical mentoring and how it plays a role in honoring youth agency and, and navigating systems in this world. And then lastly, the uh, principle of being communal, letting a young person know we are in this together. I learn as much from you as you do from me. And I, I, and I wanna have and model opportunities for searching out healthy relationships, but I also know that I'm only one part of your web of support. You know, you have so many other ama amazing relationships. What can I do to add positive relationships into your life and to be one of many who creates this web of support around you and connects you to resources, but also gets to learn from the incredible wisdom that you bring to the table. Those are the things that really anchor the mentoring mindset. Um, and then lastly, some core steps. I think what's really important too about mentoring, and we've heard this theme yesterday and earlier today, is it's not about being a savior or being a hero. It's not about being everything. It's oftentimes about the simple things and being consistent. Um, and so one, uh, one of these steps is sharing of yourself. You know, young people want to know that you love them. They want to know that you care. They want to learn from you. And so being able to share of yourself about your job, your career, your struggles, your journeys, uh, being able to say what you don't know and what you don't yet understand, expressing excitement to work with them, to go on a journey of learning together. These are all things that any adult can do regardless of your role in a young person's life because they want to learn from people who, who genuinely notice them and who care about them. Number two is a consistent process of understanding the young person that's in front of you or the group of young people that are in front of you, asking the right questions the right way, being curious, hearing their thoughts and perspectives, understanding how they see the world and really learning from that and taking that in. So having that spirit of curiosity. The third thing is validating and affirming young people. Share with them what you learn from them. Share explicitly the things that you learn. Like my um, high school mentor, she would always say to me, I learned so much from you about race, about equity, about relationships, about what it means to be inclusive. And here are the things that I've put into my life because of what you've taught me, you know, through your culture, through your lens, through your personality, through your experiences. Like really consistently and explicitly validating and affirming what you learn from young people shows them that you really are paying attention and that you see the value and perspective that they bring to the table, even through their mistakes, because that's being human as well. Number four is be a part of some type of supportive action toward a meaningful goal. Young people are incredibly diverse. It's not a monolith, right? Same as adults. Young people, even from the same backgrounds have a wide variety of dreams and interests and skills and strengths and different things that they're working on. But if you work with them to understand what's something that's meaningful for them, what's a goal they have, a passion that they have, a place they want to go, an experience they've never had before, a person they want to meet, and what are some small things you might be able to do to support action towards that meaningful goal through the strengths that you have. Because again, you don't have to be everything, but you can be certain things and, and, and have confidence in supporting through some sort of action towards a meaningful goal to that specific young person. And then lastly, you know, being clear about ways that you can help. It's okay to have boundaries as well. You're not going to be able to do everything. It's okay to make mistakes, but thank young people for the opportunity to connect with them and learn from them and think about the resources that you can send over to them that could be helpful, whether it's a training or an experience, what doors you might be able to open through connecting them to other people in your network, uh, whether or not you're interested in continuing the dialogue and relationship with them, you know, being very clear about the ways that you can help and being okay with modeling healthy health and mindfulness and having boundaries is all really essential as well. And so those are the things that I wanted to share, you know, about the mentoring mindset, because regardless of where you're from, you have the opportunity and the ability to be mentor-like in your interactions with young people through the roles that you do every single day. And young people are ready and prepared to help each other as well, and to also help to teach you about the world that they're seeing and the world that they want to build.
Beautiful. Thank you, Dudney. Um, that's just a, a wonderful way to, to think and frame really a lot of this conversation uh, throughout the day and beyond. Um, Tori, from the, the first moment that I had a chance to, to meet you and to read your book, your words have stayed in my mind and, and changed the way that I've thought about mentoring, changed the way that I've thought about the role of mentors. Um, I'm just so excited to, to pass to you for you to just, just share that, that wisdom uh, with our audience today. So um, I'm gonna I'll pass it right along and then we'll um, keep the questions coming either in the chat or the Q&A. And, &A. and um, in, in about 10 to 15 minutes when, when Tori concludes, we will uh, make sure to have time for audience Q&A and some interactions. Thank you, Matt, for having me. Thank you, Dudney, for that beautiful statement on the mentoring mindset. Um, don't underestimate yourself, brother. You got, <laughs> you have a lot to bring to the table for sure. So following you is difficult, right? Plus it's early out here in Cali. So, you know, um, but, but again, I, I appreciate being able to participate and to be a part of this discussion because it is an important discussion, um, not just mentoring in general, but just youth right? And like our responsibility as elders to our youth and what, what that all means and, and having to process that on a consistent basis so that we show up in the ways that we need to, right? Um, and so for me, that, that has looked like centering young people as early as possible in processes and as often as possible in processes, right? And, and I have to give you a little bit of background story to kind of lead you to where uh, I am today in, in terms of critical mentoring. So I, I always tell the story that, you know, I became a high school English teacher and mostly because I thought that that was the essence of youth work. I was like, I'm gonna become a teacher because I get to work with young people all the time. And then I got into teaching and recognized this is not how I want to work with young people. <laughs> um, this system is not going to let me do the depth of work that I really wanted to do. You know, I'm having 38 students in the class. There's no possible way of getting to know all of them um, in the deep way that I wanted to. Um, and then on top of that, I was responsible for all this academic content that didn't leave me time to connect with them, to hear about them, you know, to, to do the things that mentors are, are able to do. Um, and so I was also getting my PhD at the time and I thought um, I'm going to study this concept of mentoring because this is maybe going to tell me what I can do outside of teaching uh, to work with young people. And so I was doing all the research. I was on fire about mentoring. I loved it. I set up um, a program on my high school campus. What I saw, what I saw as a mentoring program and what I saw as the best research-based mentoring program that sort of ticked all the boxes, right? And did everything that it was supposed to do. And we ran it for a year and young people were like, nah, this ain't it. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, what I had to do was sort of examine what that was all about, right? And so I realized that I made a lot of mistakes. You know, I set up a mentoring program for me based on my values and my ideas as a middle-class college going person um, that did not take into account what young people wanted, what they needed out of this process. You know, I was all focused on academics. Young people wanted to do other things, right? And so the best thing that I have ever done in my career was to, to take that time to be humble, right? To receive that critique and that feedback from young people and to listen, right? And then what young people said is, you know, academic help is great, but it's not helping me to deal with you know, the micro uh, microaggressions that I'm experiencing in my, in my math classroom. So you're telling me to get to that person's class on time and to behave and to, you know, be nice and to take my tests and to do all the right things, but I don't feel safe in that class. I don't feel like the teacher likes me, right? And these are things, this is where I started to sort of check my adultism early on in the process too, right? Because these are things that we hear from young people. And what do adults typically say? We say, you know, we all have somebody that we don't like. We have a teacher we don't like. We have a boss we don't like. You kind of have to learn how to deal with it, right? And so we end up making these comments that are not really helpful. They're dismissive of the experiences that young people are having, right, in these spaces. And so, again, I started leaning in and hearing just more about, you know, how do I become a, an artist? You know, I, I get all kinds of stuff in school, but I don't get any 
support for, you know, how do I become a content creator, an artist, something, you know, how do I build a life out of music or how do I build a life out of art? So I started hearing all of these things that young people wanted that were sort of outside of the auspices of school, right? And the critical mentoring part really comes into play because of A, the youth centrism, but also because young people were saying, I am dealing with issues around race, around class, around gender, around sexuality, that no one is willing to talk to me about in school because these are taboo sort of political topics that teachers won't touch, right? Um, and that I'm having trouble navigating because again, adults are mostly dismissive of these things, right? Like just get over it, you'll be fine. Um, and then I started thinking about the idea that as we grow up and we get told that and we adjust and we adapt, right? And this is where I talk about this, this concept of, of this concept of toxicity, that we just sort of adjust, right? Um, and we stop noticing some of these things. I apologize for my dog in advance. It's early, so I'm, I have to be in the backyard. My house is asleep. <laughs> um, but I, you know, so I, I started thinking about all of the, this feedback that young people were giving me. Like, we need to center these issues because, yes, math class is important, but there are these other elements where I'm not learning how to advocate for myself. I'm not being able to process the violence I'm experiencing, the racial trauma I'm experiencing, because nobody will talk to me about it. And adults have adapted so much so that they either don't notice it or they just figure, you know, I'll eventually become like that or like them and sort of become dead to it, right? Which to me was mind open, was like mind blowing, right? Um, was shocking, was sad. Um, because I recognized how much toxicity I myself had adjusted to. And I think I'm, I'm becoming, I'm realizing that even more now in the, in the midst of these civil rights movements that young people are leading for us today, right? Um, because I'm having all these conversations with adults where they're saying, you know, these young people just don't understand the reality. And I'm having to, to reflect that back to them and say, do you hear yourself? Right? Like we've adjusted so much to this as reality that we're rejecting any kind of change that these young people want because they've decided, you know, it's not okay for me to live in a racist America. It's not okay, you know, for me to live in, a, in, an, in an America that is okay, with, is okay with relegating an entire group of people to poverty. You know, it's not okay, you know, that folks are out here getting sick and that there's no protection for them, right? Young people are saying, this stuff is not okay. And if you've adjusted, if you've adapted, that's fair. But this is not the future I want for myself and for the young people coming after me, right? So as a critical mentor, I had to start thinking about what was happening in terms of systems around these young people. My whole model adapted from what do I do to young people to fix young people, right? To how do I collaborate with young people how do I highlight the assets and the skills that they have? As Dudney was saying, like they already bring a lot to the table. And then how do I become a good co-conspirator, a good supporter, a good resourcer, right? So my mentoring framework shifted to helping young people sort of not adapt, but process what's happening around them. How do I become a support? Um, how do I open doors so that they can do their work, right? You know, at this point in time, I'm saying my responsibility is just to resource youth as they do the hard work <laughs> of shifting systems, right? As we know, historically, that has been their responsibility. Um, so, you know, for me, again, I don't know if I want to necessarily identify as an elder quite yet, <laughs> but um, I think the young people would see me as an elder. Like, my job is to hold them up. You know, my, Angela Davis says young people should be able to see further because they're standing on our shoulders, right? And so for me, that's, that has been my mentoring responsibility to think about the systems around young people. How do I help to alter those systems around young people? How do I, how do I curate safe spaces for young people? How do I ensure that they have voice, power, and choice, right? That their voices shine, that they come to the forefront, 
um, that, that they do are able to do all the power building that they need to do, because I very much see young people as responsible for saving all of our lives. Um, and and I, I see example after example after example of how young people are doing this. And in my own mentoring relationships, and, and just on a micro level, you know, I, I called my protege yesterday because I saw he tweeted that he sort of, he was moving into this new phase of a career. And so I called him and said, hey, how can I help? Like anything I can do to support. I left that conversation with resources for me. <laughs> and I was thinking, how did that happen? I called to help you and to provide you support. And he was like, oh, you, you know, you, I know you're older and you're in this podcast game. Let me help you, right? So he started sending me resources. And so those are the experiences that I've been having with young people for my entire career, you know, as an educator and as a mentor, has been young people really having more power, more knowledge, um, you know, more sympathy sometimes than, than we do. And really me just constantly checking my adultism, thinking about how I can be a support. How can I best support young people, right? How do I give them, give over to them the wisdom that I've had, I've had an opportunity to acquire without dictating to them, right? And saying, this is the way that you have to do these things, right? Um, I always say, I always present young people with the information. Here's what I went through. Here's my song. And then young people get the opportunity to, to write the remix, right? Like it's their job to just keep building upon what we've done, right? And, and not having to to um, not having to owe us anything, right? Not having to do things the way we've done them or because we think they're the best way to do them, but really them saying, okay, I see you, elder, respect, thank you for what you've done, I'll take it from here, right? It might not look the way you've done things, look like the way you've done things, um, but I appreciate the lessons that you've taught me, right? And I think that that's, for me, mentoring has become that kind of ongoing exchange and it's become a process of, it's, 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 it's in my cultural DNA at this point, right? I'm starting to recognize how communities of color have always done this for one another, how queer communities have always done this for one another. Um, we've done it out of necessity. We've done it out of survival, right? And as Dudney talked about, naturally occurring mentoring relationships which you know ha have hardly been recognized enough, but have been the lifeblood of, of marginalized communities. Because if we didn't do it for each other, who was who was going to do it, right? Um, and so for me, critical mentoring has been about this. It's been about learning from young people. It's been about thinking about tearing down systems and trying to figure out how to tear down systems, right? It's been about opening doors and providing platforms and letting young people not, I don't even like to use the word letting, you know, centering young people as they lead. I don't have the power to let them, right? <laughs> centering young people as they lead. Um, and, and, and now, especially in this moment, it's been about honoring young people's ability to radically reimagine society as we know it to stop limiting them with our jaded adultism, right? And to say, young person, thank you for being able to dream and for being able to see a future that we couldn't imagine because we're sort of stuck where we are. Um, and for, you know, again, right now, all I can think about in terms of, of our work at the Youth Mentoring Action Network is how do we continue to fuel that? How do we continue to support young people? Because they literally, very literally are the change. Right, I think I probably overspoke. I probably overspoke, man. <laughs> um, but that's for me. That's the work. That's the work, and that's what critical mentoring looks like. That's that's beautiful. And no, neither of you overspoke. I, I love that both of you are so deferential. You're both wondering if you did, but no, not at all. Uh, we had wanted to end around ten thirty Eastern to give a full fifteen minutes for for a conversation. Um, Please, for all of our participants, use the chat to, to ask some questions. Also, the Q&A, if you prefer to be. Uh, the Q&A will just get to, uh, to us as panelists. The chat is, is more public, but we would love to hear from, from everybody. I'm going to start, actually, with a question that came in from an earlier hour, um, but I think is so relevant right now. And it talked about kind of cross cross-ethnic, cross-racial, cross-gender relationships and the power of 
bridging divides, but also the power of representation and how for those that maybe don't um, don't share um, those traits should should act, and then the power of also being able to step out of the way and make sure that young people have uh, mentors who are uh, who share um, sh share some of those traits. So, so talk about that that tension and balance. Um, Tori, maybe I'll start. Maybe I'll start with you there. Uh, I love the question, and people ask all the time about cross race matches, especially nowadays, you know, because folks are just like, well, should we just let black folks mentor black folks or, you know, what does this look like? I think the power of mentoring relationships can transcend things like race, class and gender, right? I think that each person, uh, but especially the adult has the responsibility of um, developing consciousness, right? And awareness um, and, and cultural humility, right? So that they're able to to learn from um, and that they're able to sort of continue to um, sort of have new ideas, right? Not sort of be stuck <laughs> in one way of doing things. I think that if the adults practice that kind of humility, that it doesn't matter. Um, I will say though, on this point too, that we tend to think that mentoring relationships um, need to happen for folks of color more or for marginalized identities more. Uh, and I really want to break that idea. Every successful person requires a mentor, number one. And I think number two, especially as we're dealing with a lot of these racial issues, we have to actually be a lot more intentional about mentoring white youth. Um, and I think that that's something we don't talk about enough. White youth, especially white, wh white boys in particular, are being heavily targeted um, and negatively influenced by these sort of dark web, white supremacist groups. And, you know, every time I see sort of an expose or read an article about this, I think, where are their mentors? That's what I think. You know, where are the adults, their, the white adults in their lives who can intervene um, and who, who can teach anti-racism or model that for them? And I think that that is a group that we really need to sort of wrap our arms around right now in the mentoring community in order to disrupt some of what's happening. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Um, Dudney, anything you'd want to add to, to that question before we move to others? Would love to hear your voice. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, with everything um, Tori just shared. And, you know, I think when it comes to connection, um, connection is just a powerful thing, you know, and you can feel a connection with folks from all kinds of backgrounds and backgrounds and experiences that might surprise you. And I think when we're connected to somebody, we notice it. And, and I think it's, it's meaningful to follow um, that connection and that instinct. And like Tori said, how do we weave in from there the resources and the tools that are available around being humble, about being open to growth, about being trauma-informed. So it's really about adding tools to your toolkit to support who you mentor and who you're in relationship with, as we all do with any relationship, with friends, family, with partners, leaning on those tools to support that connection is really important. Um, but those connections can come from anywhere and, 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 a, and in any background. And there are other resources that can be woven in to support specific things related to identity as well. Love that. Before I pass to Aaron and Eli for, for other questions or thoughts, I just, Tori, something you said really, really stuck with me, especially in terms of mentoring our, our white youth. I feel like the most valuable experience that I had in my childhood was how lucky I was to have so many of my mentors who were not white. And I'm realizing that in our society right now, in, for many white communities, unless you are actively working in ways that my older sister and my father did to make sure that I was in situations where I was one of the few white people, those kind of experiences shaped everything that I came that came next. And I think for a lot of white communities needing to work hard to potentially, you know, join the basketball league, not in your mostly white community, but going to another community and, and getting to really feel that and experience that, I think is another piece of the of the mentoring that that young young white kids need um, as, as, as they grow. And it's something I'm realizing through this conversation, how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to experience. Aaron, I, I saw you unmuting before, before I spoke there, so I'd love to pass it back to you. 
Yeah, I, I, first of all, I just, um, wow, Tori, you were speaking my language over here. I was, you couldn't see me, but I was snapping. I was really excited. And I, and I honestly just bought three copies of your book to hand to my employees for our youth program. So um, thrilling. So here's my question, because we face it all the time, very much the sense we are about centering youth experiences, youth voices, and, and providing space for our young people to lead. But we often come up against adults who are living in that toxicity, as you described, very dismissive of, of these young people, um, or it's a, things are going to take a really long time, you know, be patient kind of attitude. So what are your strategies for dealing with those adults when we do open those doors who still are, are dismissive of, of our young people? I, mean, I think we need to do a much better job of preparing adults to deal with young people. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, in my organization, we have <clears throat> completely developed a culture around if you're going to be in this space, you have to be comfortable with listening to young people um, and not just listening to them, but sometimes deferring to them, right? Uh, a lot of times deferring to them um, because we really are youth led. And so I find myself having to make sure that I do that pre work with adults to say, you know, you're stepping into this space that the power base here are young people. And so let's have some conversations about what you might need to do <laughs> to adjust to that reality, right? And, and it's, it's like any community that we have to tell folks, we have to hold them accountable when they don't mind the community's norms, right? And we have to tell folks again <laughs> and hold them accountable when they don't mind norms. Um, and, and for the most part now, again, we have built this culture where that's the expectation for adults coming in anyway. But I do think that, you know, what I tell a lot of organizations to do is work with your adults first. I have always said that critical mentoring especially starts with adults. If we don't fix ourselves and understand how to come into a space, a relationship with young people, young people, especially nowadays, they are not having it. <laughs> um, they just are not like there's low tolerance for that and my my biggest fear and this is one of the ways I frame it to adults my biggest fear is that young people will no longer need us right and we don't want to get to that point where young people are like my elders are trash I can't get anything from them right and so we have to just constantly do our own work of showing up in the right ways so that young people can receive the wisdom that we have right um, and then that they will be able to use that to continue on. But I would just say, prep, prep your, prep the old folks. They need work. <laughs> awesome. The only thing I'd add to that too is like, you know, adults and young people, you know, you're both human beings and you can bring your perspective to the table. You're in dialogue with each other. And I think what sometimes adults just need to remind themselves is I'm in dialogue with another human being here. Right, so it's not about imposing, it's not about, but it's also not about being dishonest about what you believe and what you need, right? That's how we learn from one another too. And so having a space where you can defer, where you can be humble, where you can share your honest perspective and engage in healthy dialogue is really important and empowering for both sides to be able to learn from. And like Tori says, it allows for communal understanding because um, young people are gonna do the work with or without you. Um, and so that's definitely true, um, but adults can still participate um, as human beings in this world as well and in conversation with youth. Can I throw in a question? Cool. Easy, like, go for it. Yeah, I was just thinking about the current environment we're in and the athletes, the younger athletes that are starting to take more stances and whether it's on race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, um, religion, so forth, that there's more and more young people that are beginning to engage uh, on these activism and, you know, whether it's, you know, the legacy of Muhammad Ali, the, the Colin Kaepernick, all the different ways that things are now transforming in our sports culture. And so the question I have is kind of how does the critical mentoring, the mentoring movement, in terms of, you know, what you said, the gap of a mentor, having a mentor, informal, formal, you know, how does that intersection look and what do we need to be doing with these young people and, and with the mentors to really encourage and 
and transform our sports culture through mentoring. Yeah, just curious your think, thoughts. Yeah. yeah, I think one thing that comes to mind is, um, is being able to follow as much as we want to lead, right? I think that so much of what young people are doing is they're sharing their story and their reality and their vision for the world, right? And how do we as adults, coaches, whatever role that you have, how do we sort of participate in a dialogue, in a conversation where we truly feel like we can really learn and follow their lead for the vision that they have, right? So I think sometimes experiences um, of young people are sort of diminished as, oh, they're just not regulated or they're just lashing out or, you know, we can have these different ways of talking about young people that I think we need to sidestep and really zone in on what are they trying to teach me here? What, are, what is it that they see about what our world can be? And how do we collaborate with them in the dialogue for a stronger culture, um, better norms for everyone? And again, you can bring your perspective to that table, but I think having a willingness to follow as well is really important to share power in a proactive way. Tori, do you have any thought? I'd love to hear it, Tori, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, for me, this is where near peer mentoring means a lot, right? That, you know, as athletes become mentors to one another and think about, um, you know, how they can build upon uh, know one another's ideas and um, perspectives and movements, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. For, I mean, for me, this very much looks just like community right, um, and community organizing. When we start talking to one another and realizing that there's synergy um, and then supporting one another and help in resourcing one another, then all of a sudden we have this bigger movement that we didn't realize, you know, existed, right? Um, I definitely like, so, you know, Marshawn Lynch to me is a good example of, you know, he would probably call it an old head using that language from, <laughs> from Northern California, you know, but he, but he's a, an older athlete in the game an OG in the game who said to, to these young athletes, like, you know, take care of your mentals, take care of your chickens, right? Like your, your, your mental health, your body, your bodily health and your, your money, like take care of those things because, you know, the game is not going to, to take care of you in the long haul, right? Like you have to take care of yourself. And so, these are all examples of mentoring, right? That happened publicly right in front of us <laughs> um, without us really knowing. So I think, again, like tapping into those things that are already there, tapping into that, that mentoring that's already happening for older athletes to, to see what Marshawn Lynch is doing and to, to actually maybe formalize that a little more and start providing structures for young athletes to get support and help and, nav and navigate it, right? Um, but I think that this becomes a movement of just taking care of one another and loving one another and whether that happens in sports or it happens in arts or in schools or wherever it happens um that's what for me that's what that is it's about community building right and then sharing with each other and resourcing one another amazing thank you so much and i just have to say like you guys have daryl working with you at the at the center right like he's yeah. an example yeah. of this. he does uh -huh. work really well um, and so you're already yeah. winning. <laughs> I, I know. I, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I'm going to let him know. I'm going to make sure he goes back if he's not watching right now and watches this. Just for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So I know that we are closing up and we, and we promise kind of that throughout the day is, is I'm jokingly referring to it as this high intensity interval training of the 45 minutes on the 15 minute break to get ready for that next hour and wanting to continue with that, that rhythm um, throughout the day. But um, there, there's so much more. Um, all, a, a lot of the resources that Dudney has created for Mentor are available at mentoring.org. Um, so for those that want to hear a lot more, he put together a fantastic masculinity guide uh, for mentors about how to avoid toxic masculinity and really to focus on positivity. Um, so that's a, 
that's a resource that we can link to in the chat, but it's, it's available um, as everything for a mentor for free on our website. Um, and then just, I can't recommend highly enough Tori's book uh, for anyone working with young people. It's called Critical Mentoring. Um, it is a, uh, a reasonable read in terms of length and also really every chapter can stand on its own. Um, so it can be, can be read in, in, in bite-sized pieces almost as, as long range articles, but it's, it, it will change the way you think about the work you do with young people um, and, and give new guidance and expertise. So, um, Tori, Dudney, just your expertise, your, your willingness, your openness, it, it, I continue to learn and be inspired by, by all of you. Um, Dudney, we just got a request. Oh, you already, Aaron already did it for you. I love it. Um, Sean, thank you for the comment about the, the masculinity guide um, and Tori has already linked to it. There's both a, a shorter version that, that's trying to be a little more accessible for maybe some, some of the coaches in your program who don't have time to go into a more in-depth document. And then there's a, a really deep version for the those that are, are interested in that and the academics among us who really want to dive deep. Um, so well, both are available. Thank you again. I, I can't say on, on behalf of Mentor and the mentoring field, I can't say this enough, just how powerful it is to have so many people here together um, thinking about this, working on this, working on being better in this field. Um, as Tori said, you know, our, our young people are, are the ones who are going to save us all, and it, it, it's our job to to help them and and to get out of their way. Um, I, I wanna I wanna end with just repeating something that I heard from Tori that I will take away from today. Um, that it's not even about letting young people lead; it's about centering young people as they lead, and, and that that context shift is is so powerful. So. Thank you all. We have another amazing panel joining at, at, at 11. And um, in, enjoy this break. Recharge as you need to. Um, and just, just thank you so much. Tiffany, shout out back to you. Um, being here, our, our leader from Mentor Memphis Grizzlies is on today that's really using the power of sport um, locally and, and, and the power of the Grizzlies brand to, to elevate our field. So just just thank you all much love and uh we will get to continue hearing again in in 11 minutes eli any last any last uh, comments that's me amazing thank you all yeah Pr brilliant um yeah we'll look forward to the transition and continuing all these uh, wonderful conversations <laughs>